Now I saw a question on my one of my YouTube videos that said, can we have a tour around your studio? Um, my studio features, my chaotic room here features on a lot of my films. And I thought, yeah, okay, I'm gonna show you uh, around it. I also saw another question on the uh, home recording forum. It said, how much is a home studio? And some wise crack put on there about the same as a divorce. Um, not sure how much that is don't really know but um, at any rate I don't think you really need to spend a huge amount of money now I'm going to answer the home recording question first just before I show you around the studio basically what you need is some basic equipment to get you started now when I say basic equipment I do mean things like a computer it can be a PC or a Mac it doesn't matter which uh, you could also have an iPad using GarageBand but there are a few restrictions with that. So a home studio setup should consist of a computer with some software, a microphone, an audio interface, uh, perhaps a MIDI keyboard, a bit like one of these, a bit like this thing here, and a pair of speakers. Now the speakers are important. They are going to be your sort of end products your what you hear and what you're recording is going to come through those speakers which puts it in touch with the outside world so your mic and your speakers are really important so the microphone you can see this on my other camera here I've just got an iPhone 4 which is also videoing um, I've got an SE 3300 it's quite a cheap mic but very good it's capable of some excellent results you're currently listening to this via the mic here that mic is picking up my voice rather than the mobile phone audio which isn't very nice at all so the mic is very important and the speakers are important if you get those two things right you've got that's a good start um, having a cheap mic into an expensive audio interface it's not really any point so an audio interface will cost you maybe a hundred pounds for a two channel interface i've got this uh thing here which is the uh tascam US144, I'll just put that in front of here so you can see it. It's just got a couple of inputs there, uh, a couple of input volume controls, and it's also got USB and MIDI. So that is the Tascam US144, and it's great. It's bus powered, so that means you can go outside. If you've got the laptop on batteries, you can go outside and record with a couple of nice mics with phantom power. Will drain your battery though. <coughs> You can get various products from people like Motu or um, Edirol or M Audio, any of those sort of people who will make two channel interfaces which will get you started. Software wise, Logic, Cubase, FL Studio, Ableton, the list goes on and on and on. And generally speaking, they're all sort of 24 bit audio capable and they all will do at least 44.1 or 48 kilohertz. Now, the rest of the kit this studio is stuffed full of things and what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this other camera around so that you can see basically all the little bits that I've got so we've got the mic here the SE 3300 it also has a surround this little sort of semi-circular guard now what that does is it helps to minimize reflections when you're recording against the walls coming back into the mic so it's meant to give you that sort of dead sound of course it won't do it all but it'll give you a very good reduction uh, things like this this is the um, little pop shield here it's basically a stocking material which goes in front of your mic like that so that when you're singing through there when you're breathing through there into the mic it won't pick up any wind noise or any P or B or any of those sort of sounds. So it's an essential part of the recording process. You can make one with a coat hanger with some stocking material around it and it's absolutely fine. You know, you can pay up to sort of 80 pounds for one of those, but it's just a bit of stocking material. That's all it is suspended in a, you know, in a round shape. You can get this one's just a single. You can get a double one doesn't make any difference to the sound it just stops all those extraneous noises so if I move around to the first thing I'm just going to do an anti-clockwise direction around my studio you can see here an old guitar amp what am I doing with something like this an old H&H &H guitar amp 
I've got some other really nice amplifiers here, which I'm going to show you in it. Why have I got an old transistor amp? Well, actually, it was my first guitar amp. I used to have a speaker cabinet with it, which I blew because I was young and stupid. But I've kept it because it's a really good spring reverb. If I want a snare drum reverb, I put the snare drum through that and I get a really nice spring reverb through that. And I did a reggae album where I used that a real crack to that snare with a spring on it. It's mono as well, which is kind of goes with that whole genre, that whole sort of reverb genre. So I use I use it for that. It's still in my studio. It still functions perfectly. I've got another speaker cabinet that it can go through. It's pretty good for jazz gigs. Fine. So next round, we have got my Yamaha YC45D. If I just lower the camera, there we go. Now this old thing, I've done a demo of some of these things online as well. So do check out my channel and you can see other things that uh, other little bits of gear here that I've that I've demoed. This is an early 70s Yamaha Electone keyboard and you can get sounds from this. You cannot get from a computer system with a computer plugin, you just can't, it, it doesn't work that way. Um, the number of sounds you can get out of this is endless because of all these little sort of switches and draw bars and all sorts of things. So above that, I've got space for guitars hanging up here. So I've got my a few things hanging up here at the moment. I've got my Fender Music Master, which has got two bass strings and four guitar strings so I can play bass lines and chords all on the same neck. I've done a demo of that as well. Feel free. The links are all at the top of this film. You can see little sort of links to other videos. My trusty Fender Stratocaster, Epiphone Firebird bass. I've got my Fender Precision bass here. There we go. Good old bit of kit. And I've got an acoustic bass as well just at the end there. And then we come to the rack in the corner. There we go, I'll just put the camera slightly closer. There we go. Some of this, some of these bits of kit I was given. Lots of places clear out, they go, oh, you know, we've got this, do you want it? Yes, please. You never know what it could be used for. Now, of course, you've got to balance this with the sort of hoarding aspect. You know, if you're gonna collect stuff, only collect it if you use it. And actually I do use all this stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from the top of the rack. We've got a quadroverb. I've just uh, got a light here, which I'll uh, just plug in so that you can see a bit better. I've got a quadroverb, which is a 1980s multi effects unit. And uh, it's a great, I love it. I think it's, it's a really nice bit of kit. Um, it's got a completely different sound to any of the other reverbs, anything on the computer or anything anywhere else. So, Below that, I've got a Boss Digital Reverb. You know, this is 1980s digital reverb technology, really old. The one below it, the Roland Depth 3, is even older. That's kind of 1986, real early reverb, and it's got um, your MIDI control as well. I've got a Zoom Studio here, and it's virtually impossible to get a bad sound out of one of those. It's just a, you know, tweak and, uh, you know, listen to the sound you get. If you like it, great. If you don't, just turn the controls a bit more until you find something that you do. There's no digital readout on this, for example. Then I've got a MIDI Uniter. That um, basically is uh, like a MIDI to USB sort of patch bay where you can put all of your MIDI instruments into the Uniter, both in and out, and it converts to USB. And it also deals with things like time code, which is, you know, tape. Tape recording is having a tape recorder communicating with your computer. You know, it's, it was a real sort of, there was this transition between tape machines and computers where you'd record all your audio on tape and all your MIDI information to computer and the two would communicate. Um, below that, um, I've got a, a synth here, a Roland SC880. It's kind of a, you know, a 90s, synthesizer. Uh, there's a gap here, there's an orchestral sound module. I think that's, I took it out to a gig, I was playing strings or something. Um, so that needs to go back in there. An old Roland MKS50. And then below that, we've got a couple of samplers. We've got the Emu E5000 Ultra. Now I bought that 
about 16 years ago uh, and it was expensive it was 1400 pounds at the time from uh, you know a place up in London and it's hugely capable but of course lots of this stuff has been superseded by the convenience of computer recording but I do use it because there's a, it's got a certain sound to it especially with the Akai S950 now that really does have a have its own sound this is the f one of the first digital samplers ever uh, and then a MIDI patch bay so I link all of, of this stuff up so that you can have various setups that's what it used to have that's what you used to have to have to do the reason I've got all this stuff is I do use it I do I do work this way sometimes I think it's very important to to have a grip on those old recording techniques um, down on the tray here I've got a, a pod and a Behringer V amp which are sort of uh, guitar preamps they're digital emulations of various amps over the years you can see a demo of the pod on my channel as well now moving around if I just take the camera out slightly I've got this so this is kind of the left hand side of my main uh, set up here my main front desk I've got the a mixing desk here it's a Soundcraft Spirit Studio I was given that it was being thrown away just surplus requirements getting new gear in it was one of the schools and I thought okay well you know there are a few things that I needed tweaking on it but it's fine it's it means that I can use this which is the um, my old 16 channel hard disk recorder now I do uh, a few live gigs with it so I take the 16 track out to a gig set it up and record now yeah why couldn't I record straight to, straight to computer well you can but if there's any slight glitch with the computer it'll just stop recording uh, and that has happened before whereas that thing will just keep going it'll keep recording and it's got enough space easily to do a you know five or six hours at 16 track that's enough what you then do is you bring it back into the studio the 16 outputs of this are connected to the desk and the outputs of the desk if I just put the test oscillator on and just make the tracks ready to record you can basically feed your oscillator there we go you can see the meters on here are connected to these red faders on here so that's basically how you used to record you used to have a, a mixing desk with eight buses or eight sub subgroups which would then feed your tape recorder so you could record eight tracks at once that's enough if you've just got a drum kit and a, a bass player and then you layer it up with guitars and all sorts now just taking a closer look at the 16 track machine just above it um, is this it's a, an old Behringer eight-way mic preamp so it converts eight XLR mic inputs into a single optical lead which then you can feed your you know, digital machine it kind of it's it's a re it's just a convenient way of getting eight extra mic channels the preamps aren't going to set the world on fire you can hear the difference between those and more expensive ones but when you're just doing a live gig and you just want to plug mics in and get a good overall sound it's just a ticket above that is a drama stereo compressor they're worth having really worth having especially if you are recording through a desk into a into the machine you can stick your bass or your guitars or whatever just to put a little bit of compression on each as you go in to the recorder so it just makes it slightly easier when you come to mix above that is a um a motu 828 mark ii which is an old sound card i bought that new with my first mac computer it the mic input started to go wrong on it but the line inputs all still work and i can actually use it this and this with con in conjunction with the hard disk machine when i go out to record gigs so that's why i've kept it i've kept everything pretty much i think i sold a keyboard once and a small guitar amp uh i think that's about it so i keep everything i use everything that i've got now we've come around to the just pull the mic back of the camera back a bit in the middle here is my main i'll just switch that light off in the middle here i've got my speakers and my sound card and my computer now this is the this is the latest sound card that i bought eight mic inputs two of which you can select to be what's called liquid preamps this focus right sort of trademark and what they do is to simulate 
old bits of um, uh, of studio electronics so you can get various preamps and valve sounding preamps through these two uh, inputs and they do work really nicely they've all got a bit of character there speakers as i said at the beginning you've got to get speakers that you know how they how they're going to sound now back in when i was working in emi studios back in the 90s you used to have engineers who come in with an album that they put on to listen to the speakers in the room to get used to they knew the sound of the album they knew the mix and knew how much bass there was mids treble all that they listen to it on a new set of speakers and after a while they basically get used to that you know used to that pair of speakers nowadays of course when you've got your own setup and you are using it all the time it's a little bit easier to get used to a pair of speakers so these are jbl monitors they've got a five inch driver for the base and then a a tweeter there we go we got those there now over on the right hand side here i've got another mixing desk think, why has he got two mixing desks well actually the mixer on this side here deals mostly with the synthesizers and the sound modules that we had in the other rack there so those samplers and all of those other keyboard sounds they are mixed via this mixer there we go because my main mixer doesn't have enough channels so i route the main output of this into two channels of this and that's how i do it now over in the corner there just with a mixer you can see an atari computer it's still got an atari it works it's 31 years of age now uh, i think 1987 whatever that means no 1989 I beg your pardon. it's not quite 30 but it's old enough and it still works so I've got a version of Cubase on that which runs absolutely fine and then you can use that as a MIDI recorder audio editing you can't do on that unless you've got a massive great hard drive and a, the biggest hard drive you can hook up to that is not as big as all the hard drives we get now I did some audio editing at university on these and you press go and then you think, OK, well, I'm just going to go and have a couple of pints and I'm going to come back from the student union, as it was, and it would just be finishing up. But that's audio, which is obviously much more memory intensive than MIDI. So I have this also as a, so a, a different way of working and an insurance policy in case my 11 year old MacBook here. In case that decides it's not going to work anymore i've been using this macbook every day for 11 years uh, and it's never seen an upgrade i've made a video about that as well about upgrading and software and all that so and you're listening to the soundtrack the soundtrack is being recorded onto this machine at the moment so underneath the mixing desks is basically just a load of storage i made the table for the mixing desks out of an old uh, pearl drum rack drum racks were really popular in the sort of 80s and 90s you basically have your kick drum and then a rack going all the way around onto which everything else was suspended all your toms or your cymbals snare and hi-hats would be still on their own still you know uh, conventional stands so that was being thrown out as well and i thought i love that i can make a desk out of that so underneath is just lots of uh, just lots of things other mixers little live mixers my drum kit stored under there i've got a bass amp under there my mic leads my guitar pedals etc so it's important to have that underneath storage so moving around we've got the guitar amp section so i've got my jc120 down here fox ac30 and i've got my EBS bass amp with the with the head that you can see above it and my Fender blues amp and then I've got a couple of Roland cubes as well so that is essentially that's my sort of guitar amp collection the more eagle-eyed of you who have seen my channel will say where's the Marshall well it's actually it's gone back to its rightful owner after 12 years it's very lucky to have it for that long so looking up to here this is my sort of two track department with the graphic equalizers and cassette decks and CD recorders. Why do I have this stuff? Well, actually the cassette recorder makes me a bit of money because I do things like stereo transfers from people's old tapes 
put them onto computer and become mp3 files. I know you can do it yourself now but it's nice to have a really decent deck at the start. So it's an old Denon twin deck. I don't record on tape anymore. Next to that is a graphic equaliser. Why have I got a graphic equaliser? Well sometimes when your tape's a bit deficient in treble but it's a Dolby encoded thing you can get a bit of extra clarity before you go to a computer by sticking it through the graphic. And then I've got a CD recorder on the left which is well, I used to use that when I just had a mixer and no computer. So it's sometimes useful though if you want to go straight to CD or record something straight onto a disc. That's how you do it. You can't buy blank discs in the town I live in anymore. I think that goes for quite a lot of other places. It's all Amazon or mail order now. And that's kind of saying something about what's happening to CD. Got an old record player here. It's mostly for just if I'm working in here, working in my workshop, I've got something to listen to. But occasionally I do record transfers for people as well. Now, this, the Revox A77, I've done a demo on this as well. This is something that is very much used whether I'm tracking on multi-track or whether I'm using the computer. My reggae album that I did for a library company was mixed onto one of these, onto well, onto this one, simply so you can drive it a bit and you just get that analog sort of tape sound. You can wake up a digital recording quite nicely on something like this, which just gives it a bit of an edge. It gives it a bit of a retro -y edge. This one operates high speed, so it do 15 inches per second. Those of you in the know with the tape machines, that's fast. And then on the left, I've got this. This is the Fostex R8. It's an old eight track tape recorder. And this really started the, the, the sort of the proper home studio boom, really. After the cassette multi-tracker, you got things like this, the R8, which was quite expensive in its day, but it you, meant you could record eight tracks onto a reel to reel tape. So the quality was instantly improved. So, um, and below that, I've just got another one of those stereo compressors that sometimes I'll put the signal through before it reaches the tape machine. And that comes from the main output of my mixing desk. So the main out fader feeds the two track directly. I don't have a patch bay. Patch bays can be a bit of a nightmare, uh, especially ones which are just plug jacks in the back and then you have patch leads because the more jack, more connectors you have in the signal path, the more likely it is you're going to get problems with things like noise or rustling or loose connections and that sort of thing. So to that end, I have basically wired in the entire mixing desk bespoke. Everything has been cabled up. Now, this represents really my training at the studios in London. I've used that training in order to build my own setup. So if I lower this camera now, I lower it all the way. You can see that underneath the mixer, underneath that 16 track recorder, you can see that all of my cables are cut to length. And that one I think is just, I just connected that briefly, but everything is basically cut to length. It means I don't have to access it at all, which means that my mixer can live underneath the shelf. I'm in a space that's about two meters 80 by about four meters, roughly. The whole building is five by three. I've got a workshop next door. Um, I'll just quickly poke the camera around there in a minute. So space is at an absolute premium. I've got to make sure that I've got everything stored and everything practical uh, pra that can be used, you know, without having to unpack lots of things. So I've got everything basically ready here. So just lifting the camera up again, just have a, a look at the other side, the other wall. So there is the other camera up there that's recording the entire studio. I've got some mics here. It's essential to have a, a good collection of mics when you first started making your studio. You don't have to start with, you know, have to have a massive shopping list, but I've got two of these SE 3300s. One came in a cardboard box, the other is in here. I've got a um, the AKG C3000, which is a good starter mic. If you're just looking for something that you can stick in front of an acoustic guitar, 
and sing into it. You can record effects with it, sound effects, something like that. It's quite cheap. You do, however, notice the difference between the cheap starter mics and when you buy a new mic, you suddenly notice how much better it is than maybe the one you had previously. But that's part of the excitement. When you buy something like that and you get it home, you think, oh, this is amazing. This has really, really revolutionized my sound or the, you know, the quality of the stuff I record. But keep the old mics. You know, those C3000s, they sound all right over a piano. They sound great in front of acoustic guitar. And actually the cheaper mics, you might find something that is actually better on an instrument than maybe the new mic is. So always keep things like that. There's no, not really any point in selling mics like that because they're not really worth anything secondhand. That does really apply to so many things. And when you're looking at things like, um, you know, drums that I've got stored under here, I've got a drum kit there. I shall never get rid of it. There's no point. There's just no point in getting rid of it. If you if you sort of really savvy with what you buy and how much you spend, and there's another load of things down there as well. There guitar cases and there's all sorts. Some of you may be thinking at this stage, why does he have a wheelbarrow in his studio? Surely that's either in the garden shed or it's outside. Well, I'll leave you to look at my channel. Just type in Dan Baker electric wheelbarrow and all will be revealed. Now over here behind the other camera, I've got a PA system here. I've got my mixer, which is right on the top there, then a power amp, which doesn't occupy all that case. And then a pair of old PV Hisis twos. Why have I got those? Well, they still work. They're, all of that stuff works. It still works. And I'm actually loath to buy new things like this, partly because of the longevity of these of new bits of kit. It's three years, well, three years, another one, four years, bam. And you just constantly having to update stuff. Now, looking at my guitar amps here, there is, however, a, a, a caveat. If you've got something that looks like this, I know lots of people go, oh, look, it looks cool, it looks really retro. I went to a, I played at quite a nice expensive wedding. Um, and my brother rightly said, you can't bring that. It's just horrible to look at. People are gonna think we've just hired this really expensive band. Why can't they have nice stuff? And that's really one of the reasons why I bought that AC30. This It's one of the new Chinese ones, perfectly good bit of kit, but it just looks a bit nicer. But I've kept the old one because as a guitarist, it's nice to have these two different tones. So very briefly, I'm just going to come behind this main camera. And this is my workshop in here. This is basically where I fix stuff. As you can see, it's got stuff everywhere. There's a pair of speakers in there that I can test things. There's a soldering iron there. There's all sorts of things. It's the sort of place which I don't venture into while I'm holding a camera because I'll probably just hit my head on it or something. Anyway, there is my studio with all its little idiosyncrasies and little bits and pieces.